Well, now we've accomplished one of our goals, which was to answer this question and find the length of the opposite side. The other question was to find the size of this angle. So let's go ahead and find the size of that angle. Now, to find an angle, we are going to need the trig functions. Um, so we need to remember what's our mnemonic for the trig functions. Remember our mnemonic, SOKATOA. So it's probably a good idea when you're learning this material to always write down that mnemonic, SOKATOA. So, ka, toa. And let's make a plan as to which of these functions we're going to use. We're trying to find this angle. And remember that the convention is that we're going to find this angle just using the numbers that we were originally given. Even though we could use this number, we're not going to do that. That's not how these problems are conventionally done. Instead, we're going to use the numbers we were originally given, which I've marked with these asterisks. These are the numbers we were originally given, the 3 and the 7. Uh, well, the 3 we have marked as the adjacent side, and the 7 we have marked as the hypotenuse. So it looks like we need a trig function that involves the hypotenuse and the adjacent side. The hypotenuse and the adjacent side, that's cosine. Ka, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The cosine of what? Looks like we have to give a name to this angle. Remember, you could never just write this. That's terrible. We can't just say cosine equals. We have to say the cosine of what angle? Well, let's call this angle theta. So then we can say that we're focusing on the cosine of theta. Ah, uh, ka. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. What do I plug in for theta? Nothing. We don't know what theta is. What do I plug in for the adjacent side? 3. What do I plug in for the hypotenuse? 7. Cosine theta equals 3 sevenths. Uh, you could do this division right now, but maybe it's a little bit more efficient to postpone that for a second. Let's just get theta by itself. How do we get theta by itself? By doing the opposite. We need to get rid of this cosine. Well, what's the opposite of a cosine? The opposite of a cosine is an inverse cosine. I don't think we've actually specifically talked about that, but we've talked about how the, inverse of, uh, how the, uh, the opposite of a tangent is an inverse tangent. So you shouldn't be too surprised that the opposite of a cosine is an inverse cosine. So we need to take the inverse cosine uh, of both sides here. What happens when you take the inverse cosine of the left-hand side? Well, all you have left is theta because the inverse cosine is the opposite of the cosine. So they annihilate each other. But the golden rule of algebra says that if we're going to take the inverse cosine of the left-hand side, we must take the inverse cosine of the right-hand side. Uh, this could also be written as arc cosine. So these two lines mean the same thing. Some people would write this as cosine uh, with a negative 1 superscript, and some people would write it as arc cosine. Both of those mean the inverse cosine. So these two mean the same thing. I think um, most of the time in physics, maybe it's more common to use this form. I think. Actually, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I get this is just the form I guess I usually use. Remember, the negative 1 is not an exponent. This is kind of bad notation because the negative 1 looks like an exponent, but it's not. It's just a symbol that means that we're taking the inverse cosine. On a TI-83 or 84 calculator, on a TI-83 or 84 calculator, you hit the second button, then you hit the cosine button, and because you hit second first, you're going to get the inverse cosine, which is printed above that button. Uh, a TI-83 or 84 calculator will put the left parenthesis in for you automatically. So then you would type 3 divided by 7. 3 divided by 7, right parenthesis, and then enter, and that'll give you uh, the answer. Uh, you need to have parentheses uh, on any calculator here because there's two things that we're taking the inverse cosine. Uh, uh, this is how you would do it on a TI-83 or 84 calculator. And most other calculators, I think, are pretty similar. Uh, this allows us to find the whole thing in one step rather than taking the 3 sevenths first. Uh, let's see, so according to my notes, we would then get that theta is 65 degrees. Theta is 65 degrees, approximately. 
So that answers that part of the question. Well, this problem was similar to the previous problems because, again, I gave you two sides. But it was a little bit different because on the previous problems, I gave you two legs. Where on this problem, I gave you a, one leg and the hypotenuse. So this was a little bit different because we were uh, working with one leg and the hypotenuse. Uh, but we can still use the same basic approach. Um, but we don't use the inverse tangent here. Uh, you can see we used cosine and inverse cosine. Uh, that should have been straightforward. On all the previous problems that I gave you, I was giving you the opposite and the adjacent sides. Well, when you're given the opposite and the adjacent sides, it's natural to use tangent and inverse tangent. But on this problem, I gave you the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. In this problem, you were given numbers for the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. Well, if you're given the adjacent and the hypotenuse, it's natural to use cosine and inverse cosine because ka, cosine refers to the adjacent and the hypotenuse sides. Um, maybe I'll also mention, again, uh, the, the previous problems that we've been doing, I was giving you two legs. And on this problem, I gave you one leg and the hypotenuse. Now, actually, in physics, um, the vast majority of the time, you're going to deal with problems where you're given two legs. It's actually going to be uh, really quite rare to have a problem where you were given the hypotenuse and the leg. So this is uh, less important than the previous problems. But this is still a basic enough skill that you really would be expected to be able to easily solve this problem in a physics course. Even though this type of problem is not going to come up that much, um, you should have the skill to solve this type of problem quite easily if you ever do encounter a case where you're given the hypotenuse and one leg. Uh, because it's really the same type of basic approach that we use for the more common type of problem where we're given two legs. If this problem gave you any difficulty, then before you proceed, I would recommend just redoing the same problem. Keep doing this problem until it's boringly easy, and then you know you're ready to go on to the next problem.